Hello everyone, I want to take a few minutes and go over an example of using a diagnostic strategy that led me to using a picoscope and in-cylinder pressure transducer testing to verify uh, what I found. Hey guys, I'm changing up a little bit the way I've done this video. I hope you bear with me and let me know if you like it and if it works. The first half of the video is showing how we diagnosed a vehicle to come to the point where we needed to use a picoscope. Second half of the video, starting at six minutes, shows how we analyze the data that we captured off the picoscope and used the rulers and such like that. Here we had a 2008 Chevy Silverado that had a complaint of falling on its face at wide open throttle. Full throttle, heavy load, it would fall on its face. Uh, many ignition components and the fuel pump had been replaced, but they still had this issue. Um, now, one of the first steps in any proper diagnosis is to verify the customer concern. In this instance, the vehicle was blocked in the shop by many ve other vehicles and a tow truck, so I didn't have an opportunity to actually drive it. So when I was working with the students, I decided the next step would be to uh, do an all-vehicle uh, DTC scan. This is one of the most important steps that we should always do. It can save our tail, man. You can really get blamed for all kinds of stuff with a vehicle. If you don't have codes documented of what was going on as it came to you, um, you might be held responsible or liable for all the other problems the vehicle has. So always take the time to do this complete vehicle DTC scan. So many technicians uh, complain and don't like to do an all DTC scan due to the time that it takes to do it. Well, here's what I do. I start the scan, hit the all DTC scan, whatever tool I'm using. While it's doing its scan, I do the other important part of a uh, diagnostic procedure, which is a visual inspection. Can't tell you how many times you take a little time looking around underneath the hood, you can find something that maybe other people missed. So here we are, I didn't see anything going there. This vehicle did have a uh, code in a digital radio receiver. Not too worried about that. We're not worried about that at all, really. Um, it's not going to cause an issue with repeat 0300, which is the main code it was setting. Now at this point, I wish I would have uh, checked the freeze frame data. I got to admit that I did not. I didn't clear codes or anything, but I had it stuck in my head, a misfire under a heavy load, and I wanted to attack that, and I was on a mission there. My next step is always to take a look at the scan data. Guys, this was with the key on, engine off. I always like to review the data, see if anything's going on, see if anything's obvious. Um, one thing I always pay particular attention to uh, in the scan data is the ignition one signal. And here I had a peek at the ignition one signal and the relay feedback signal. Um, not often you're gonna find a problem right there, but when you do, it is important to make sure your computer has good voltage. If it doesn't, well, everything's out of whack. You're wasting your time. So next I wanna take a look at our fuel trims. Here we start the vehicle up and it's sitting at idle. The fuel trims are not terribly bad, but check this out. Bring the RPM up to about 2,500 RPM with no load, just sitting there 2,500 RPM, and we look at the uh, fuel trims and bank two is going way positive and bank one is negative. This is a big clue in a pushrod V engine. Remember this. Now, I was thinking, let's see what, the, what cylinders are missing. So uh, looky here, we have misfires all on bank one in history. Next, I try to load up in the shop and intermittently I get cylinder number seven and a few others on bank one and misfire. So here's the facts. We have a bank-to-bank -bank fuel trim difference at higher RPM. Uh, at higher RPM, this engine's trying to flow more. And we have misfires all on bank one. In my head, this is, I've seen this before. It's pretty obvious. We have an indication of a breathing problem for uh, bank one. Now, if I had my way, I would love to do a volumetric efficiency test on this thing on the road and see what we're pulling here. But uh, it wasn't drivable and really you gotta be wide open throttle higher RPM for uh, that test to be effective. So you guys gotta remember on a push rod engine with a mass airflow sensor, we have the total air volume going into the engine measured by the mass airflow sensor. 
and it, the computer expects that to be divided up between the two banks. So if we have a bank that's not flowing well enough, like bank one is actually flowing less air than the computer thinks it is, well, the computer's fueling that thing, and it's it basically got too much fuel. It's running rich. So the fuel trims are gonna go negative. It's gonna try and take fuel away. Now, at the same time that's happening, bank two is running lean. It has more air flowing through that bank than the computer would expect. So when it's running lean, it's adding fuel. The computer is trying to compensate for that by adding fuel. So that's why we get the imbalance of fuel trims on uh, bank to bank. And then we got our misfires to go along with it. So pretty quickly at this point, I was confident that I wanna do some um, exhaust back pressure testing. Now, if you guys live in a rust belt, you know that it's not fun to take out O2 sensors on uh, 12 year old vehicles. It just doesn't always work out your way. Sometimes you'll actually break them, strip them. Uh, you gotta get the blue tip wrench out to heat them up. Um, I don't wanna do that. Spark plugs, I know they just came out of this thing. Somebody just did a tune up. So I can easily get in there and pull a spark plug and get the in-cylinder pressure transducer tester in there and test it from there. So that's what we did. Okay, so taking a look at our PicoScope captures, we had one in-cylinder. And if we look through here, this is our buffer. I like to do uh, wide open throttle cranking, idle, 2500 RPM and snap throttle. I try to do those so we got a capture that we can compare. So with this capture, here is our cranking, wide open throttle. And that's how we can verify our RPM. We are cranking at 168 RPM. Now, um, let me go ahead and put a little bit of a filter on here. Maybe we don't want to filter out too much. But if we just look at our exhaust flat, you can see right here, our exhaust flat is not flat. If I just bring down this cursor, the signal ruler, we can tell right now that we do have a little bit of exhaust pressure rise just at cranking wide open throttle. Shouldn't have anything here. We're about 2.3 PSI. Now, let me clear out the rulers and let's go ahead and look through our buffer at what we have when we start in idle. So this is at idle. And we can see clearly that we have a pressure rise as the exhaust stroke continues, we have pressure rising here. So um, we can see that there. Uh, to take a look at our actual pressures, you can see we got maxing out about 3.7 PSI. If you guys want, we can zoom in here. I really feel that an actual back pressure gauge, if you put it into the exhaust, would be reading about in the middle here, you know, halfway between the bottom and the top, I think we'd see about 1.3 PSI here. So still nothing outrageous, but we definitely see a rise in a pattern there that caught my eye immediately. And if we go and take a look here when we do a snap throttle, as we're getting into it, here we go. We can take a look and uh, figure out what our pressure is here. So on the low end, you're looking about 28 PSI. On the high end here, we're getting upwards of 70 PSI. So if we take the median of this, even if we just go here, looking at this section, here we go, zoomed in here. If we just uh, figure out what our median pressure is, we're looking at around 45, 50 PSI. This is way too much pressure. Um, also, we can take a look. I believe this is when I was about 2,500 RPM. It's always good to take a couple values, a couple different measurements at different places. And first of all, let's figure out what our RPM is here. We'll do this the same way we did last time. Let's bring these out. We'll have one of our rulers at zero degrees, another one at 360 degrees, which would be run one engine rotation, one revolution of the crankshaft. And we're at 2,500 RPM. Our low end of the exhaust pressure is about 3.7 PSI. The high end is about 15 PSI. This isn't outrageous. I usually see when you stab the throttle, you'll go up to 15 PSI, 16 PSI on a transducer. You'll never see it on a back pressure gauge like that. But this is looking kind of high here. 
Um, definitely not looking all that bad compared to when we go over to um, over here when we had our uh, wide open throttle event, stabbing the throttle here, we we're definitely high. So we have to look at this and compare it to the known good cylinder. And we can do that quickly here. This is uh, cylinder number two, which is bank two of the same engine. And uh, we can go through our buffer. Here we go. Here is uh, cranking RPM, wide open throttle. So we're cranking the engine, wide open throttle. And if you can tell here, our exhaust flat is flat. There's nothing going on. All right. Let's go ahead and get this thing over to uh, what it looks like when we start to idle. Once it smooths out. Now, you never know, if, if you don't know what you're looking at, we got to make sure we are at idle. So we'll just go ahead and measure this once again to make, check our RPM. Make sure we are at idle. I'm expecting around 700 RPM here. So we'll just go ahead and type in zero degrees for this one. And we want this cursor to be 360 degrees. And that is 720 RPM. So we are at idle. And here's our exhaust pressure. Um, this is a scientific term, negative 321.3 times 10 to the negative 3. Um, guys, just type in zero, and you have an absolute zero line there. And if we zoom in on this, let's take a look. What are the high points of this? We can filter this out a little bit, clean it up, so we don't have to look at something so dirty. And you can see here, we're not over one PSI. We are not even over uh, one PSI here. So we know that right off the bat when we had three PSI on the other cylinder uh, that was bad and we're not even over one here. Let's go ahead and take a look when we crank up the RPM. Let me see if this, uh, here's when we step on the gas. We're accelerating here and so we got a wide open throttle event and we have a peak of 19 psi or 20 psi um, and this is about 15 psi so we do see a spike there but let's let's take a look longer let's peruse a little more let's see what we had when we were sitting at uh, 2500 rpm Let's make sure, first of all, that we are at 2,500 RPM. <clears throat> okay, and we are about 2,400 RPM right here. And this is our good cylinder again. And let's just put this at zero. And then what is this one? We're reading over here. We're getting a little bit of a peak of about 1.9 PSI, but you can clearly see a difference here. Okay, if you want to make a reference waveform to compare two waveforms next to each other, it's pretty easy to do with the picoscope. You go to reference waveform, and what you want to do is go to B and hit duplicate. And then we're going to click on this. This is our B2. We're going to hit export and we can call this um, uh, good in cylinder reference number two. We can call it that and this is for the 5.3 liter. And this is an idle. Hit save. And that's been exported. Now you go to our bad waveform. And you got to be on the same type of time base or else it's not going to work. You can't, you don't want to import this on a part where it's not idling. So let's find a section of this where we are idling and pretty smooth. I think this would be probably a good section. And we go back to our tools and hit reference waveforms. And we hit import. And here's the one we just saved just now. And we hit open. And now we click on this and hit OK. Now it brought in the same waveform that we had from before. 
This makes it so we can compare them apples to apples, if you will. But, got to look here. This one's scaled up to two, and this one's scaled to one. So it's pretty easy. Let's put these both to three. That just gives us a lot of vertical uh, insight to what's going on. So put this one to three, and then hit OK. And then we're just going to slide this up. Now, here you go. You can see both of these waveforms uh, they're not lining up, and it's not easy to line up. You can play with the scaling if you want. Um, it's called the delay. So I can hit this over, and we'll see if anything gets close to being lined up. This is close enough for my liking. And, you know, these are not right on top of each other. Uh, but we could make them zeroed out if we wanted to. This is where you can clearly see the difference of what's going on. Guys, if you need to learn more about the basics of your PicoScope using the signal rulers, rotation rulers, degree measuring, RPM, all that stuff, give me a shout. I can help you out. I work over the web or in person. So I hope you guys got something out of this video. If you like it, give me a big thumbs up and like it. Um, subscribe. Have a great day.